All right. Any question on this? I should go come back to. So it's more like uh, a bit of uh, theory right now, and I'll show you uh, soon how you can apply these things. But uh, yeah, the idea is that you replace your uh, normal problem by the dual problem, and you solve essentially over the lambda. Um, <coughs> and this will be a way of, uh, again, uh, decomposing problems into uh, multi-level optimization of, for example, uh, this guy will somehow play the role of the master problem and, uh, and you will have these guys as uh, sub-problems. I'll show you that in a bit. But for now it's just showing you that uh, this dual function that you can use as a, uh, in some sense, as the coordinator, as something you will uh, optimize over via lambda, uh, is not completely trivial. <coughs> Um, <coughs> an interesting observation is that if you calculate the gradient of that function, you can use uh, parametric optimization tools as usual. It turns out that it's uh, simply um, given by the residual of your constraints. So when ax plus b is zero, i.e. feasible, then the gradient of the dual function is zero. So you have reached the minimum, right? But it's also trivial to compute the gradient of that function, it's uh, ax plus b. So you, for a given lambda, you would solve the problem, you receive an x, and then you evaluate ax plus b, and that's going to be the gradient of this guy. And if you want to compute the Hessian, of course, um, it's simply uh, doing that. So gradient is ax plus b, and then the Hessian will be uh, a times uh, del x, del lambda. So again, there you use uh, sensitivity principles or parametric NLP principles to get your del x, del lambda from this parametric optimization problem. So that's how you can build uh, this thing here. And I did not show the uh, Hessian, but you can imagine uh, what it looks like. Okay, well that's so computing these things, gradient Hessian of the dual function is, is very cheap again. So that's not an issue at all. Okay, so how can we use that in practice, for example, to decompose problems? <coughs> so here is a prototype problem. Many people discuss these things. Uh, so it's the same picture as before in some sense. I don't have a coordinating variable here, so I don't have this, uh, this specific notion. But what do we have? Um, I have uh, n problems which are uh, decomposable in a sense that if I forget that, uh, I would see that uh, I has essentially have uh, uh, n NLPs. Each of them have their own cost function, their own uh, equality constraints, their own inequality constraints. And there's nothing in here that couples x1 to x2 and x2 to x3 and so on, right? So if I was given that problem, I could solve each of them separately. You see that? No. But then I throw in a bunch of equality constraints that couple these variables, right? So you can think of this matrix as di as maybe extracting some of the xi's and coupling them between the xi's. So in that sense, x1, x2, all the way to xn, they are uh, coupled. And a classic problem, again, would be if you have a number of subsystems, each of them uh, operate according to their own uh, dynamics, maybe, and uh, some constraints and their own cost. And they are, they, they are interested in, uh, in mini minimizing their own cost. But then you have a little bit of coupling between these systems, um, which means that they cannot uh, optimize their own cost without taking into account what the others are doing. So in that sense, uh, you have a couple problem. And so again, of course, you could throw in this complete problem into a computer somewhere and solve the problem for everyone. But uh, if you have like complex systems made of a number of subsystems, it's not <coughs> obvious. A classic example of that would be a system of uh, electric dams, right? So you have a number of dams that uh, retain water and one dam is pouring water into the next one and so on and so forth. You have these type of problems in uh, uh, in Sweden, for example, maybe in Norway as well. Um, there's also a, 
in Barcelona, they have done uh, interesting things with that because they have a very, very complex uh, water system with a number of tanks and pumps all over the place. It's a big mess and uh, they don't really manage to solve the problem by throwing the whole thing into a, a computer somewhere and optimize that. So they have decomposed the problem in using these techniques, uh, considering different parts of the um, uh, water network uh, decoupled and then they have coupling between them because the water will be exchanged between different subparts. And so here is what we do, use uh, dual decomposition. So you basically take these coupling constraints and you throw them into, uh, into the cost essentially. And this is basically your, uh, your uh, partial Lagrange function. So you take the cost of the problem, this guy, plus lambda transpose times um, the coupling constraints. And you keep everything else uh, inside the problem. So this guy is minus the dual function. Huh? That would be the way I defined it. There would be a minus in front, and that would be the dual function. OK with that? And maybe just a remark. When you have a problem like this, you can do whatever you want in terms of dualizing constraints. You, can, you could, in principle, throw this guy up here. That would be a lambda times the axi bi. Or you could even throw the inequality constraints. You can do that. Uh, so it's a matter of choosing which constraint you basically, in some sense, put in the cost and which constraints you keep in the problem. <coughs> Here is your dual function. It's exactly this problem, just with a minus. Uh, some people define it with a not with the minus, and then uh, the dual problem is maximizing d over lambda instead of minimizing. But otherwise, this is the same story. Okay, so now the trick will be um, to split this uh, dual problem into subproblems. You can think of this as uh, so you want to minimize this function with respect to lambda. And whenever you, say, test a lambda, you need to solve this problem with respect to x1 and xn. And what's going to happen is that for a given lambda, I can actually solve uh, this complete problem separately for each uh, x. Yeah? Is the vector lambda, is that for the individual, for the sub-equality constraints, or is it for the whole coupling constraints? This lambda here, mm -hmm. um, so it's for the, the the entire coupling constraint. So there's another lambda for the individual. For these guys here, yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. So when uh, when you solve this problem, you have dual variables associated to these guys and also to these guys, and they are different than this one. Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, so the the idea is to decompose that problem and. Um, <coughs> This guy is already decomposed, so you don't have any interaction between the xi's. Here you don't have any interaction between the xi's, but the interactions, they uh, appear at this level, obviously. And what you can do is um, rewrite this problem. Maybe it takes a bit of on offline checking, but um, you can rewrite this function here as a sum of this, uh, uh, let's say, li's. It's like the sub-Lagrange functions, if you want, made of the... Uh, phi i and the lambdas times the di xi. It's essentially just uh, cracking this sum into some, uh, some subterms. So going from here, I just define my li as phi i xi lambda transpose di xi. And I observe that essentially have just a sum of these functions. And now these guys, there are functions of lambda, but for a given lambda, this, all these problems, I can solve them separately because they don't interact anymore. So I could form uh, some somehow sub-dual uh, functions. So here I minimize the problem over a single xi, because the x and the x don't uh, interact anymore in these problems. So for a given lambda, I solve this guy. And then this problem is essentially just the sum. So the, sorry, this thing here is just the sum of my solutions. So I can, uh, I can do that. And I should not have this actually, sorry about that. So my dual function is a sum of, uh, of these di's. Okay with that? Okay, so I had a large coupled problem. 
uh, it's now decomposed into a, uh, a series of, uh, of so smaller problems. So I could solve all these guys uh, independently, one, two, two n for a given lambda. And then you have the dual problem, uh, which would be taking the mean over lambda of this stuff here. Um, I can uh, I can solve it somehow centrally in a, a, as a master problem. And if you think a little bit about what's happening, um, backtrack a tiny bit maybe. What's always happening in this um, <coughs> dual decomposition is that you essentially have uh, the lambda that kind of uh, twists the gradient in your problem so as to reconcile the, the different problems. So if you think about evaluating this for lambda is zero, in some sense that would be saying, uh, let's disregard completely the coupling between the problems. And then the solutions you would get would be uh, the uh, solution of your individual problem. So x1, x2, and so on, ignoring the couplings. But then you have the couplings, and essentially this lambda will kind of change the gradient in your cost so that um, you take these couplings into account. Um, and some people, typically outside of control, they would uh, think of this as uh, shadow pricing. So uh, what is the price of having this coupling? And uh, this is reflected somehow in this lambda. So when, once you find the correct price uh, for the couplings, you also found how uh, the different problems should compromise uh, between each other in order to reach the, the global optimum of the problem. Okay, so how do we do that in practice? So you have these local problems, uh, that's uh, in some sense your local dual functions and you want to solve uh, this problem with respect to xi, it's simply a parametric NLP you want to solve. It's, it's even uh, uh, probably a convex problem here if you have a convex function. So for a given lambda, you can calculate uh, your solution xi, just deploying any optimization tool you want. Uh, then the gradient of the dual function is given by the residual of the constraints you dualized, so it's given by this stuff. Uh, minus di xi. And this is a function of lambda. If you change lambda, you change xi, the solution of that problem. And that would also change uh, this, uh, this gradient. The Hessian is uh, obtained via uh, parametric uh, optimization principles. Essentially, you need to compute del xi star del lambda. You can do that using the tools we discussed yesterday. And now since, yeah, should not have this again. So this, since the, the dual function is the sum of these di's, the gradient and hessian of that function will also be the uh, sum of this gradients and this hessian. So you can assemble these objects uh, very easily. So you can evaluate your di's by solving these problems. They actually may be non-convex, then you have local results. Um, <coughs> And once you have assembled these problems for a given lambda, return the uh, gradient and possibly Hessian, you would take uh, a step to correct your lambdas and then solve the problems again. And as usual, you can take gradient steps. A number of people do that. Uh, or you can take Newton steps with possibly some uh, line search. And so you have a different uh, axis of decomposition here in some sense. So uh, in the primal decomposition, we had coordinating variables that this wise that you need to tweak to uh, synchro synchronize the subproblems in some sense. And in this case, the role of the y is replaced by the lambdas, which will be adjusted so that the coupling constraints are respected. As the same story here, uh, we had the, the big p function in the primal decomposition here, the dual function. Uh, it's not ever a differentiable. When you have changes in the active sets, you have some uh, uh, some jumps in that function. So when you do Newton, <coughs> you need to be a little bit um, careful uh, and sometimes backtrack. Um, I don't have any slide on that, but there is one way of uh, solving this uh, issue of um, um, non-differentiable dual function. Um, 
And it's kind of always the same story. Huh? The dual function is, uh, is non-differentiable because of the changes of active sets. Because when you move from one active set to another, if you remember your, uh, what we discussed yesterday, the primal dual solution as a function of the parameter may have these kinks. And as usual, uh, you, would, you could smooth everything out by using uh, interior point method. So if you solve that instead, these uh, this, um, kinks you have in the dual function, they will also disappear according to the tau parameter. So you can also uh, alleviate this problem by using interior point methods on these subproblems and be a little bit careful about your tau. So essentially, use a not too small tau when the, the lambda is kind of wrong. And once it's getting to the right place, you can reduce the lambda because there will be probably no active set changes anymore. So you can uh, combine the methods very efficiently in that sense. The same is true for primal decompositions, actually. It's a good idea to uh, um, not look at the solver treating this problem as a black box, but rather as something that you should also control in order to help you at the, at the master level. I um, can show you this example again. Um, so that's a very uh, simple problem, but it's illustrating a bit what happens. So I have a QP uh, with two variables, x1, x2, and they are coupled via this linear constraint. Um, <coughs> and you can basically dualize that constraint, in which case uh, uh, the solver would, s well, the subproblems would be essentially solving the problem in that dimension, disregarding the other one, and in that direction, disregarding the other one. And um, here is what happens. Um, this would be doing uh, first order steps on the dual function. And um, there is a, something that is uh, very different than the example before. I don't know if you remember it. Uh, in the example before, we had uh, a line like this. But at every iteration, uh, we had the, um, the points always on the line. So we're always feasible with respect to the uh, coupling constraints. When you do dual decompositions, uh, you will not typically not be feasible before you reach uh, convergence. That's coming from the fact that um, if, you, if your coupling constraint was uh, well, something like AX plus B, for example, uh, remember that the gradient of the old function is given by this. And as long as the gradient of the dual function is not zero, that also means that uh, the constraints are not satisfied uh, before you have converged. So when you um, take your steps on lambda, you're trying to push the gradient to zero. So essentially, you're trying to push the constraints to zero. Before you found the right lambda, you're not feasible. So that's what you see here. The iterations actually are uh, kind of playing around with the, the constraints. And before you get here, uh, before you get to convergence, you're not on this line, so you're not feasible. Okay with that? And you see this fairly slow convergence of the lambda. It's quite classic of um, first order methods. <coughs> The advantage is that the, this, um, the steps on the dual variables are very trivial. I mean, you have no linear algebra to, to do. You would just basically receive the, the um, solutions from the local problems and assemble the gradient. That's just a sum of vector times a matrix and then take a step using that. And this kind of uh, formations are easier to distribute completely than uh, dual steps, uh, uh, Newton steps. So that's a Newton step. You would assemble also the, uh, the Hessian of the dual function. You may have to do some backtracking. So you may have some uh, alpha here that is less than, uh, less than one. But the convergence now looks like this. Uh, here I'm taking full Newton step, so it's sh overshooting a bit. But you go from this point to that point back to the solution. So here in three, three iterations, you've converged, essentially. So significantly faster. Uh, if you have QPs uh, to solve, then uh, once uh, the lambda 
is on the correct active set, you will get the solution as the next step. So that's uh, uh, it's essentially a matter of uh, hitting the right uh, active sets. And same story as mentioned that before, but the, the dual Hessian can be ranked efficient, um, which makes the problem a little bit difficult uh, sometimes. And um, yeah, it's a non-smooth Newton uh, method in some ways. Uh, you're trying to optimize a non-smooth function using Newton method, so you have to be a little bit careful. Okay with that? So yeah, this uh, decomposition methods are used a lot anytime you have uh, to optimize over distributed systems, essentially. And they allow to calculate optimal solutions for a complete system without uh, doing much computations in a central way, without gathering the information somewhere. So you tend to uh, limit communication, increase security, and all these things. Okay. Um, also prepared a bit of something about first order methods. Um, there are also quite a lot of activities on these things, or there has been for a while. And the idea in first order methods is to um, uh, not take Newton steps or SQP steps and so on, but to rely only on uh, gradient based uh, approaches. Um, so for example, if you have a very simple optimization problem, minimum of some function, here I show an example, um, gradient steps, the basic gradient step would look like this. So from an iterate xk, you follow the gradient of the function. And typically you have um, a scaling here. Kind of place the rule of a step size if you want. Uh, and that has to be, um, it has to be uh, chosen carefully. It's actually uh, uh, is the Lipschitz constant of the gradient of this function phi. So essentially, if the gradient of phi is changing very aggressively in the problem. Uh, your um, L would have to be uh, quite large. So this step size would be quite small. And if the gradient is not changing much, then you can take a, a large, uh, a small L, so a large step. Uh, so you see this effect here uh, because um, in that direction, um, the gradient of the cost is changing a lot. Right? It's, very, it's a very sharp valley. And in that direction, it's not changing much. It's very shallow. But because of this uh, sharpness here, in some sense, uh, the L has to be fairly large. So the step size has to be fairly small. And what happens typically with gradient methods, um, this is a quadratic function. So a Newton step would nail the solution in one iteration. Um, but uh, the gradient step essentially falls down into this valley and then very slowly creeps towards um, um, the solution. And because of the, um, the sharpness in that direction, you cannot take very long steps. Uh, so there was, once you are on, the, on this uh, shallow curvature, you are moving very slowly because you want to avoid uh, going too long when you are in this direction. And you have this very common uh, convergence profile, so you're essentially uh, converging linearly in the semi-log plot. Okay, with that? Just curious, how many have uh, played with the uh, gradient methods? Yeah, a bit? A few, yeah. Mm. Cool. So if you were taking Newton steps on this problem, uh, you would have uh, you will be using this uh, Hessian matrix minus one uh, to correct the gradient. Huh? Um, and that's one way of understanding what the gradient method does. It's essentially this one over L. You can view it as a very crude approximation of your gradient. Uh, if you unpack things a little bit, you would see that um, this Li, that's identity matrix, must upper bounds the, uh, the Hessian of uh, your function. And so in that case, the Hessian is, uh, has, is very large in that direction. That dictates what L has to be. So L has to be pretty large. So in some sense, the L is uh, looking at the worst, worst curvature in the cost function uh, and then uh, results in a slow curvature, on a slow convergence on the other directions. Um, yeah, here you see if you use uh, exactly the right L on this uh, on this problem, so you 
converge into the valley in one step, but then you still creep towards the uh, the solution after that. <coughs> okay with this? Yeah, simple stuff. Uh, there is a so-called accelerated or fast fast gradient approach to this. Um, you may have seen this kind of constructions. So it was Nesterov who created that. Um, yeah, it's a little bit uh, difficult to unpack what is exactly happening here. Actually, some people uh, wrote a paper explaining essentially, or looking at this as a dynamic system. And in some sense, all this stuff does, this fast gradient is uh, putting some inertia in the system is in some sense. So if you see your solution that moves uh, consistently in one direction, you will basically uh, accelerate this thing. You will like, try to take longer and longer step in that direction. And when things start going wrong, you, you slow down again. That's essentially what's happening. So when you do this on this kind of long valleys, so you're always moving in the, the same direction, uh, this kind of approach would kind of uh, accelerate the, the, the pace uh, until, you, until something goes wrong, essentially. And then uh, it will uh, uh, try to do something. Um, yeah, and you get this kind of profile here. That's the fast gradient with restart. So essentially it's really doing that, accelerating the, the pace when you're always stepping in the same direction. And once it goes wrong, you, uh, you remove this inertia and do it again. Uh, actually, no, no, that's without restart. Sorry. So that's uh, the inertia brings you too far and then it's uh, kind of overshooting the minimum and then it does this kind of oscillations. Um, yeah, and yeah, you, you can, uh, when you have this problem, you can kill the inertia whenever something goes wrong, and then you have a convergence that looks more like this, and then this, and then this, so it can go faster. So yeah, you can read about that if you want to use these techniques. Okay, but we discussed uh, unconstrained problems here, um, this kind of problem here. What if you impose some constraints? For example, if uh, you minimize uh, this function, but you want x to be in some specific set. Uh, then you can still use gradient methods. Uh, you have to move to, uh, for example, proximal gradient methods. I don't know if you have, anyone has used that, no? A little bit? <laughs> right. Um, okay, so how does it work? It's actually uh, pretty nice. Um, so the name is coming from the uh, so-called proximal operator. Uh, you have proximal operators on sets and on functions. I'll discuss that a bit later. But essentially, it looks like this. Uh, you, ha you have, say, the set, capital X, and a point Y uh, that is given. And what you're going to do is try to find the X inside the set that is as close as possible to the Y. Right? So you can imagine uh, if that's your set X, and I give this Y that is not in the set, Right? You'll try to go place X as close as possible. Right? If you're inside the set with Y, then you would place your X there. So if you have simply a box here, for example, you would get this kind of uh, behavior. If you have the Y here, you would place the X here. If you get the Y here, you place the X here, and so on and so forth. If the Y is inside, you place the X inside. Okay? Then the proximal gradient uh, steps would look like this. You take a normal gradient step on X, and then you do the prox op operator on that. So in some sense, um, <coughs> you may have uh, a gradient step uh, that brings you, let's say your XK is here, your gradient steps, step brings you here, or, uh, yeah, that would be this step here, the xk plus the gradients. And then the prox operator brings you back um, in the set, right? Here is an example of uh, solving this QP with a box uh, query constraint using the prox uh, gradient step. So you start up here, the gradient step brings you here, and then the prox operator brings you back. On the, on the set. Then the next gradient step brings you here and the prox step brings you on the set again. This way and this way. Right? 
and that's going to be the solution. And if you take a new step from here, um, it should bring you again there and bring you back in the set. Uh, you can do fast proximal gradient steps. You just take fast gradient steps in here. Same story. You can accelerate the, the pace when you always step in the same direction. Um, and with these simple approaches, people have done a lot of uh, different uh, nice tricks. Here is an example. If, um, if you have a QP problem with a simple bounce, mm -hmm. uh, so that could be a box like this, um, and special case, your, um, your um, Hessian matrix here is diagonal, right? So only elements on the, um, on the diagonal. A QP like this has actually explicit solutions. You don't need to do any computation to calculate uh, the optimum. Um, turns out that uh, when you have a problem like this, all you have to do is solve essentially the unconstrained problem, um, which is essentially given by, uh, if you want, x star unconstrained. That's going to be given by minus h minus 1f. So essentially just finding the minimum of this quadratic function. Um, and um, if h is diagonal, then uh, that will be simply the element ii of h minus 1 times fi, if this matrix here is uh, diagonal. Um, and then you take that, and then you project using the prox operator and then uh, you have your solution. And if you have simple bounds, the prox operator is, uh, is completely trivial. Um, if you think in one dimension, uh, if that's your feasible set, lower bound, upper bound, um, if you apply the prox operator on this guy, if you get a point here, you should bring it here. If you get a point here, should bring it here. If you have a point inside, you should leave it inside. Right? So it's basically just clipping the solution. Um, that will be an example of that. Uh, here, uh, the Hessian is, um, is diagonal. You can see that because the ellipsoids are aligned with the axis of the problem. And uh, that's, uh, that's the, uh, the step, minus h minus 1f. And that's the proc step that projects you inside the box. And that's the optimum. So a QP like this, you can just apply on every coordinate uh, the midpoint rule. So it's like, essentially, uh, you have these three points. You take the point that is in between these three points. And that solves the problem. So if you have uh, the step here, uh, you, the midpoint is this one. If you have the step here, uh, the midpoint is this one. If you have the step here, the midpoint is this one. right? It's sometimes called a clipping. So you take the step and then you clip what you have to the the box. Yeah. That that only works for um, like boxes. Yeah. And do the box need to be aligned with with the axis? axis yep. So you can't be diagonal in any way. No. If you twist anything, then everything is lost. <laughs> um, but it's a good thing to think about because it's not completely uh, absurd that you build problems with a diagonal H. If you think about it, when you do MPC, uh, the, the, the weighting matrix that you put on, uh, on your uh, states and inputs, of course you can put entries everywhere you want as long as it's uh, def uh, positive definite. But most often people just put a weight on each of uh, you know, x1 square, x2 square, u1 square and so on, because playing with all the weights is complex. That's an example where the H would be diagonal. So like a naive MPC with simple bounds um, that would have this, uh, this shape here. You would have on top of that uh, equality constraints for the, um, the dynamics. That's another problem. But this part, you could solve it explicitly. Yeah? Yeah, exactly. I'll show how you can use this uh, trick for uh, MPC problems. 
so yeah, now the MPC looks like this. Um, w would be made of your uh, state and inputs, x, k, u, k. Um, you may have a box constraint, so it basically you bound your uh, inputs and, uh, and states, and you have your dynamics, initial conditions. Uh, you can just rewrite the dynamics in a compact form. So it's essentially a sum over some matrix C times W, K, and some matrix small c. And so again, if H is diagonal, uh, and if we dismiss that constraint, uh, you could solve this problem uh, explicitly uh, in like uh, the midpoint rule. So this problem alone would be extremely easy to, to, to uh, solve. So how, how, what can we do with this, guys? Any idea? Yes. Just put them in the cost. That will create a gradient in the problem. So we, you will not change your Hessian. It will be still diagonal. So this dual function, you can evaluate it explicitly in like no computation at all, almost. Right? So in that specific case, that's, that's still an NPC problem. So it's not a trivial thing. Uh, it just has a specific property that H is diagonal. So you only use weights on your x squares and u squares, essentially. No, no uh, cross terms. Is that a double sum, or is it some um, You mean, yeah, so here you take the sum of all this. Huh? K appears twice. Ah, okay, the indices, yeah, okay. Call it I. Yeah, so, sorry about that. Mm. Right, now this uh, uh, dual function, you can decompose it um, along the, the summation k. And what happens is that the, the lambda is multiplying this. It's not easy to see, but uh, you can see this as a sum of dual functions that depend on lambda k, lambda k plus 1. Well, these guys are basically associated with the different uh, stages in the dynamics. Uh, so your dual function is actually a sum of uh, dual functions uh, written like this. And all these guys, of course, can be uh, um, solved explicitly. So then you can have a, a very, very simple MPC algorithm. So you would um, solve these dual functions uh, with uh, prox uh, gradient steps. Uh, if h is diagonal, you can do it uh, explicitly. If it's not, then you have to iterate this. Then you get your dual function, and then you take uh, a gradient step on, uh, on the dual function in order to uh, minimize the dual function. Right? So that applies uh, both to the case where h is uh, not diagonal, but then you need to do probably a number of uh, prox gradient steps, and you don't have explicit solutions. When h is diagonal, then this is uh, done in, uh, in uh, no time at all. OK with that? Yeah. Um, oops. Yeah. So this situation, when h is diagonal, then uh, this step is, uh, is explicit. And then, um, then you can have massively fast uh, MPC schemes in these specific cases. Um, and that's maybe, uh, it's coming back to the, the, the QP lecture in some sense. So the problem you have will have a strong influence on what kind of code and algorithms you should use. You remember that the horizon length and stability and all these things. These questions also uh, should come to mind. If you, do you have uh, purely diagonal weights on your MPC scheme? Yes, well then you should probably uh, consider this type of techniques or what you can do to uh, be uh, faster. Yeah, that will be the specific algorithm for diagonal H. Just evaluate that gradient step or fast gradient step. Evaluate again. It's so extremely cheap uh, code. You could throw that in any Mickey Mouse CPU. It will be no problem. OK, but uh, we can do a bit better, actually. Um, can argue if it's better or not, but uh, here we, so this is very cheap, um, but then we take uh, gradient steps on the dual function. 
So we'll have to do this many times because it's, it's a first order method. Uh, what you can try then is rather to take Newton steps on the dual function. So instead of just following the gradient, you, uh, you uh, take Newton steps. If you do the same stuff, decomposition, everything, so the same as before, um, you also end up solving this, uh, these sub-problems. Uh, they are also just a matter of clipping if, uh, if H is diagonal, and then you form uh, the gradient Hessian of the cost function, and then take a Newton step. And you most often need a little bit of uh, backtracking to uh, control the uh, non-smooth or non-smoothness of the dual function. Um, so this kind of uh, thing has been done, for example, in uh, codes like QP dunes. Um, and yeah, same story as before. If um, if you have a diagonal H, um, you can uh, can be massively fast here. Okay with that? No. Okay. Um, yeah, we're almost done. Um, maybe I'll uh, briefly finish that in the afternoon. It's just a few slides. And then uh, I'll still be around for a bit if you want, for example, to discuss your projects or get some advices. Um, that's maybe the right time. Yeah? Cool.